Hello and welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor, sponsored by ProScan, and today's vignette will focus on the role of contrast in CAT scanning and magnetic resonance imaging in the area of the body, the brain, and the spine. We're going to focus initially on the brain and concentrate on neurologic diseases and pathologies. We'll start out with a simple chart that will show you where CT or CAT scanning is preferred, MR is preferred, and when contrast is indicated as the basic standard. But remember, those of you that watched our last vignette, the use of contrast is more frequent in less experienced facilities and with less experienced interpreters. Let's get right to it. Let's start out with the brain and this first chart demonstrates a tumor that occurs in the brain associated with nerves called the acoustic neuroma or the schwannoma. In patients with gradual hearing loss, MR is the preferred modality over CAT scanning and contrast is the standard of care today. Now let's drill into this a little more deeply because MR as a modality is progressing at rapid speed. What used to be one millimeter of in-plane resolution is now a hundred microns of in-plane resolution on some newer scanners without an injection. So the ability to pick up very small neural tumors or nerve tumors of any nerve, any cranial nerve in the brain without contrast has improved dramatically. So even though today contrast is the standard of care, this is probably going to change. And MR cisternography or water weighted MRI without contrast is going to take over, save time, save money, and maintain the sensitivity and specificity of contrast enhanced MR. In fact, many new MR scanners can already do this and show you small nerve tumors that are two millimeters in size or less. You see the rest of the chart segregated by disease process and by tissue analysis. For instance, if you are in any way worried about air or gas on a physical examination, you should probably perform a CT. If you are concerned about a head injury and you're in the ER, you should probably go right to CT. But you don't need contrast for any of these rather specific brain indications. Let's look at the next chart of presenting symptom or condition. And the one where contrast is indicated on this list is the brain mass where neoplasm is suspected above the brain stem. Now not always is this totally necessary, but this is how most major professional organizations would list contrast indication with these disease processes. The contrast may be there for improved detection. It may be there to improve specificity. It may be there to improve the overall analysis of prognosis of the mass. But for these other conditions, neurodegenerative disorders, atrophies, dementias, Contrast is not indicated in the brain with MR or with CT. And you'll note that for almost all of these conditions or symptoms, MR is indicated over CT with the exception of a mass in which calcification is strongly suspected for some other reason. And CT may be used as an alternative to MRI in certain dementia states where the patient is uncooperative, but still MRI is preferred. Let's look at our next overall brain list of presenting symptoms and conditions. When you're in the skull base and you're worried about a fracture or you've had trauma and you're worried about a facial bone injury, CT is preferred. But for these other conditions, MR is preferred. And when you get low down in, in the brain, where it may be a little bit tougher to see, 
or analyze a lesion, contrast is often indicated. Or if you have an inflammatory disorder, like sarcoidosis, or as you'll see later on, an infectious inflammatory disorder, then contrast is often the standard, especially if you're worried about a meningeal process where non-contrast imaging may show nothing at all. CT may be used as an alternative when granulomatous disease in the brain is suspected. The next group of conditions includes brain tumor once more, the most common malignant supratentorial brain tumor, the astrocytoma, and for astrocytoma diagnosis and follow-up, MR with contrast is the modality of choice. For inflammation and infection, MR or CT can be used, but contrast is indicated in both. For meningeal disease, MR is preferred with contrast as previously stated, and for metastatic disease, a common request. MR, because of its greater sensitivity with contrast, is the standard of care. On the other hand, when you're down again in the lower aspect of the brain, in the skull base and bones of the temporal region, looking at the middle ear, looking for cholesteatomas and infections, CT is preferred. You can see from this next list of presenting symptoms and conditions that MR is preferred in all of them. And I won't list them off one by one. But the lower down you get in the brain for non-bone conditions, non-skull base conditions, non-skeletal conditions, MR becomes better and better and more superior to CT. So in the posterior fossa, MRI is queen or king. Three conditions where contrast is often indicated are orbital disease, pituitary disease, and disease in the posterior fossa. Let's take one of these though, pituitary disease. Today, the standard for pituitary adenoma evaluation is contrast enhanced MR. But what does that really mean as a free thinking, creative doctor and physician? Well, do you need contrast to diagnose pituitary adenomas? Not really. Because the MRI is there to evaluate a pituitary macroadenoma that is larger than a centimeter that's compressing other structures. You can absolutely do that without administering contrast. But what about the small, tiny microadenoma? That may require contrast to improve the diagnostic sensitivity. On the other hand, a woman comes in with an elevated prolactin and you find the microadenoma. What do you do? You treat that patient medically. What if you don't find the microadenoma and the prolactin level is elevated? You still will usually treat that patient medically. So it is not absolutely, positively necessary to administer contrast for the evaluation or detection of the microadenoma, especially when the prolactin level is moderate to very high. But the standard today, as recommended by the major societies, is contrast-enhanced MR. But as you get into deeper discussion and cost containment and practicality and consult with your radiologic expert, you'll find less and less that contrast will be used for such applications. Another chart showing presenting symptoms and conditions in the brain shows MR dominating in them all with a few I'd like to pull out. Seizures, where MR is far preferred over CT, and strokes, where MR is far preferred over CT. But let's look at stroke. Stroke is not an indication for contrast-enhanced MR because of MR's tremendous sensitivity. The lower down in the brain you get to evaluate a stroke, 
the more disparate MR and CT are. The better MR is compared to CT. In fact, it's so much better in both the supra and infratentorial space that again, CT isn't really indicated for stroke unless you can't perform an MR or the patient cannot cooperate for the MR. Two areas where contrast may or may not be indicated depending upon the specific scenario which we will discuss in subsequent vignettes are seizures and radiation damage. Well, this concludes our initial foray into the neural axis. As you can see, contrast is indicated on MR or CT for infectious, inflammatory, or tumor or mass-like conditions. Contrast is usually not indicated for traumatic conditions or for stroke. In subsequent vignettes, we're going to drill into disease processes by major conditions. I look forward to sharing this with you. Have a great day.